STS-27 was my, was my third launch, and it was only the second launch after the Challenger accident. Well, I will never forget, we maneuvered the arm, and Mike Mullane was my arm operator, so he moved the arm over there, and we brought up the television image of the right wing, and I looked at what I was seeing, and I said to myself, we are going to die. The Northrop P-61 Black Widow is a twin-engine United States Army Air Force fighter aircraft of World War II. It was the first operational U.S. warplane designed as a night fighter, and the first aircraft designed specifically as a night fighter. Created by Northrop Aviation in collaboration with the British Royal Air Force, the P-61 was also the first aircraft designed to use radar. With its mysterious appearance and name, the Black Widow ruled the night in the waning months of World War II. When World War II began, the U.S. Army Corps and the British Royal Air Force flew mostly outdated aircraft compared to the war-ready counterparts on the Axis side. In August 1940, 16 months before the United States entered the war, the U.S. Air Officer in London, Lieutenant General Della C. Emons, was briefed on British research and radar which had been underway since 1935 and had played an important role in the nation's defense against the Luftwaffe during the Battle of Britain. General Emenos was informed of the new Airborne Intercept Radar, AI for short, a self-contained unit that could be installed in aircraft and operated independently of ground stations. In September 1940, the Tazard mission traded British research including the cavity magnetron that would make self-contained interception radar installations practicable for American production. Simultaneously, the British Purchasing Commission, evaluating U.S. aircraft, declared their urgent need for a high-altitude, high-speed aircraft to intercept the Luftwaffe bombers attacking London at night. Night fighters would soon become their own category of aircraft. A night fighter, or all-weather inceptor, was a fighter concept. Still, it wasn't until after the catastrophic bombing raids over Europe, particularly the London Blitz in 1940, that the military air force has really found a need for a plane catering specifically to these types of missions. The Northrop Aircraft Corporation, located in California, had only been in active operation since 1939, mainly as a subcontractor for larger aircraft manufacturers. It was definitely an unlikely candidate to develop the world's first night fighter. More prominent corporations such as Lockheed, Grumman, and Douglas were already committed beyond their capacity, stocking America's existing aircraft fleet. Northrop availability gave it a window of opportunity. On the 5th of November, Northrop and Pavleka met at Wright Field with Air Materiel Command officers and presented them with Northrop's preliminary design. The Douglas XA-26A night fighter proposal was the only competition. Northrop's design was selected. Following the USAAC acceptance, Northrop began a comprehensive design work on what would become the first dedicated night fighter. The result was the largest pursuit class aircraft flown by the U.S. during the war. The aircraft was huge, as Northrop had anticipated. While far larger and heavier multi-engine bombers existed, its 45.5 feet or 14 meter length, 66 foot or 20 meter wingspan, and projected 22,600 pounds or 10,251 kilo full load weight were unheard for a fighter, making the P-61 hard for many to accept as a feasible fighter aircraft. Some alternate design features were investigated before finalization. Late in November 1940, Jack Northrop returned to the crew of three and twin-tail rudder assembly. To meet the USAAC's request for more firepower, designers abandoned the ventral turret and mounted four 20mm Hispano M2 cannons in the wings. As the design evolved, the cannons were repositioned in the belly of the aircraft, 
The P-61 therefore became one of the few U.S.-designed fighter aircraft to have a quartet of 20mm cannon along with the NA-91 version of the Mustang and the U.S. Navy's operated F-4U-1C Corsair as factory standard in World War II. Following a few small changes, Northrop's NS-8A fulfilled the USAAC's requirements, and the Air Corps issued Northrop a letter of authority for purchase on December 17th. A contract for two prototypes and two scale models to be used for wind tunnel testing was awarded on the 10th of January 1941. Northrop's Specification 8A became, by designation of the War Department, the XP-61. Northrop's engineers built a full-scale wooden mock-up of the XP-61. So, on March 10th, another contract was approved by the Undersecretary of War for five and one and a half million dollars. This ensured the production of 13 YP-61s, and the groundwork was laid for the production of the airframes that would become the famous P-61 Black Widows. It was also a rather large aircraft for a fighter, at 50 feet long and a wingspan of 66 feet. The P-61 was a twin-boom design with a crew consisting of a pilot, gunner, and a new member, a radar operator. He would operate the compact airborne interceptor specifically designed to fit inside an aircraft, leaving out the middleman who had previously relied on instructions from radar-operated out-of-ground stations. The production model of the SCR-720A mounted a scanning radio transmitter in the aircraft nose. In airborne intercept mode, it had a range of nearly 5 miles, or 8 kilometers. The unit also functioned as an airborne beacon or homing device, navigational aid, or in concert with interrogator responder units. The XP-61's radar operator located targets on his scope and steered the unit to track them, vectoring and steering the pilot to the radar target via oral instruction and correction. Once within range, the pilot used a smaller scope integrated into the main instrument panel to track and close on the target. This rotating 30-inch scanner receiver dish antenna would sweep the sky with a knife-like beam. When used, it reduced the ground echoes that plagued long-wave radars at low altitude. This shorter wavelength enhanced accuracy, bedding interceptors within just 100 yards of intruders in total darkness. His radical shift was the main reason that the Black Widow could fly at night, as the device allowed pilots to navigate and locate airborne enemies in real time. Red-colored cockpit lighting was another innovation that further aided the vision and night fighting. The Black Widow's lethal bite could rival any that the enemy had to offer. It was armed with four 20mm Hispano M2 forward-firing cannons mounted in the lower fuselage and four 50 caliber M2 Browning machine guns lined up horizontally with the two middle guns slightly offset upwards in a remotely aimed dorsally mounted turret a similar arrangement to that used in the B-29 Superfortress using four-gun upper-forward remote turrets. The XP-61 spine-mounted dorsal remote turret, driven by the General Electric Gyroscopic Fire Control Computer, could be aimed and fired by the gunner or radar operator, who both had aiming control and gyroscopic collimator sighting posts attached to their swiveling seats, or could be locked forward to be fired by the pilot in addition to the 20mm cannon. The radar operator could rotate the turret to engage targets behind the aircraft. Capable of a full 360 rotation and 90 degree elevation, the turret could be used to engage any target in the hemisphere, above and to the sides of the XP-61. The unique system was to often have difficulty achieving an accurate aim. The P-61 was powered by two Pratt & Whitney R2800 double WASP radial engines, each packing 2,000 horsepower. The two engines were each mounted approximately one-sixth out on the wingspan. It was capable of a maximum speed of 366 miles an hour, which was relatively fast considering its immense size. The P-61 also had an internal fuel capacity of 646 gallons. Its estimated fighting weight was over 29,000 pounds. Main landing gear bays were located at the bottom of each nacelle, directly behind the engine. Each engine cowling and nacelle drew back into tail booms that terminated upward in large vertical stabilizers and their component rudders, each of a similar shape to a rounded right triangle. 
the horizontal stabilizer extended between the inner surfaces of the two vertical stabilizers and was approximately three-fourths the cord of the wing root, including the elevator. The elevator spanned approximately one-third of the horizontal stabilizer's width, and an overhead plan view angled inwards in the horizontal from both corners of the leading edge towards the triangle edge approximately 15 degrees, forming the elevator into a wide, short trapezoid. Leading edge updraft carburetor intakes were present on the wing shoulder and the root of the outer wing, with a few inches of separation from the engine nacelle itself. Thin horizontal rectangles, with the ends rounded out to nearly a half circle, with multiple vertical veins inside of it to direct the airstream properly. The main fuselage was centered on the aircraft's centerline. It was, from the tip of the nose to the end of the plexiglass tail cone, approximately five-sixths the length of one wing. The nose housed in an evolved form of the Signal Corps' radar SCR-268, the Western Electric Company's SCR-720A. Immediately behind the radar was the multi-framed greenhouse canopy, featuring two distinct levels, one for the pilot and a second for the gunner above him and behind him, the latter elevated by approximately 6 inches, or 150 millimeters. The forward canopy in the XP-61 featured contiguous, smooth-curved, blown plexiglass canopy sections facing forward, in front of the pilot and the gunner. Beneath the forward crew compartment was the nose gear wheel well, through which the pilot and gunner entered and exited the aircraft. The radar's operator station was at the aft end of the gondola. The radar operator controlled the radar set and viewed its display scopes from the isolated rear compartment, which he entered by the way of a small hatch with a built-in ladder on the underside of the aircraft. The overall design was exceptionally clean and fluid, as the aircraft possessed very few sharp corners or edges. Another stealthy innovation was the new glossy black paint in the metal armor instead of the usual olive green and gray paint. Like flight tests in Florida in October 1943 pitted both schemes against each other, the black color was not detached in 80% of flights throughout the gauntlet of anti-aircraft searchlights. Starting in February 1944, all Black Widows were painted deep black, allowing the P-61 to truly fit its name. It took Northrop engineers over a year and a half to fix developmental delays and revisions. All the while, the Army Air Forces were desperate to start training night pilots. They have no problem getting the crews of volunteers to the training. Redesigns during the production phase cost Northrop two critical wartime years. Although its late rollout and obsolescence will ultimately be its demise. The Black Widow delay is turned into a platform for innovation. The P-61's official public debut was quite dramatic. In January 1944, AA-61 performed a nighttime flyover of the Los Angeles Coliseum, filled with 75,000 attendees as part of a new Army-Navy show. According to some accounts, the crowd couldn't see the plane and could only hear its engines passing over. The first squadron to fly the Black Widow in Europe was the 422nd Night Fighter Squadron on May 23, 1944. Almost a month later, the 425th Squadron received their Black Widows. However, both of them received the aircraft too late to participate in the D-Day invasion on June 6. The first P-61 engagement in European theater occurred on the 15th of July, when a P-61 piloted by Lt. Hermann Ernst was directed to intercept a V-1 flying bomb. Diving from above and behind to match the V-1's 350 mile an hour speed, the P-61's plastic rear cone imploded under pressure and the attack was aborted. The tail cones failed on several P-61A models before this problem was corrected. On the 16th of July, Lt. Ernst was again directed to attack a V-1, and, this time, was successful, giving the 422nd NFS and the European Theater its first P-61 kill. The absence of turrets and gunners in most European Theater P-61s presented several unique challenges. The 422nd NFS kept its radar operator in the rear compartment, meaning the pilot had no visual contact with the operator. As a result, several pilots continued flying their critically damaged P-61s under the mistaken belief that the radar operator was injured and unconscious, when in the fact, he had already bailed out. The 425th NFS moved the radar operator to the gunner's position behind the pilot. This provided an extra set of eyes up front and moved the aircraft's center of gravity about 15 inches or 380 millimeters forward. 
changing the flight characteristics from slightly nose up to slightly nose down, which improved the P-61's overall performance. By December 1944, P-61s of the 422nd and 425th NFS were helping to repel the German offensive known as the Battle of the Bulge, with two flying cover over the town of Bastogne. Pilots of the 422nd and 425th NFS switched their tactics from night flighting to daylight ground attack, strafing German supply lines and railroads. The P-61's 420mm cannon proved effective in destroying German locomotives and trucks. During this battle, the P-61 obsolescence became apparent. Lieutenant Van Nieswande was piloting his Daisy May Black Widow when an encounter with the twin engine Messerschmitt 410 led to a pursuit across the top of the woods. This wonder attempted to attack and follow its enemy by chasing it at full throttle, but by the time the Black Widow caught up, the ME-410 pulled away at 400 miles an hour, making the P-61 seem painfully slow in comparison. The 422nd and 425th squadrons also found themselves critically short of spare parts by the end of 1944. Being a smaller company, Northrop couldn't keep up with the demand and supply issue was never corrected. The squadron had made do with whatever equipment they had on hand. Most operational 61s ended up being sent to the Pacific. After Guadalcanal was secured in late 1942, the American stronghold urgently needed nighttime protection from Japanese nighttime raids launched out of bases in the surrounding areas. The Black Widows weren't ready yet, so the Americans temporarily adapted B-25s, P-40s, P-38s, and P-70s as night fighters. Finally, in May 1944, the Black Widows were ready to fly in the Pacific. The first to receive a P-61 was the 6th Night Fighter Squadron. They were the only night fighting squadron until the 418th and 419th Squadrons also began working with Black Widows. On July 1st, 1944, the 421st Squadron was also activated, and operating from bases at Nadzab, New Guinea, and Wake Island. Actual fighting by the P-61 was sparse. The 418th Squadron, based on the island of Morotai in the Hall, Maharas and the Ducius Indies operate at the top, scoring Black Widow. Highlighting the P-61 light action and combat, the 418th conducted a mere 18 successful attacks. Its most triumphant mission came when the three Kawasaki Ki-61s were destroyed in a single night. Despite its innovative design, the P-61 was only able to play a minor role during the last six months of World War II. The Axis powers were already too weak to put up much of a fight on the ground, let alone in the air. The Lady in the Dark 61, piloted by Captain Lee Kendall, is perhaps the best-known Black Widow in the world. The fighter was photographed hundreds of times in the Pacific Theater. It was also the aircraft that presumably scored all the final two aerial kills of World War II. The first kill happened on the night of the war, and the second one almost an entire day after all battles had officially ended. Captain Kendall took down Japanese Imperial Army aircraft in kamikaze missions by aggressively pursuing them and causing them to crash on their own. The P-61 proved capable against all Japanese aircraft it encountered, but saw too few of them to make any significant difference in the Pacific War effort. Simply put, the 61 arrived too late to World War II. Although it was useful in battles against the Japanese Air Force, it was already obsolete in Europe by the time it got there. Northrop engineers tried to fix as many issues forced by the P-61 as possible. He redesigned the airborne intercept radar and improved the remote control turret. Turbochargers were also added to the aircraft, but it still lagged in speed. Despite his late arrival, Black Widow still saw combat in every theater of World War II. The fighter destroyed a total of 127 enemy aircraft and 18 German V-1 buzz bombs. The useful life of the Black Widow was extended for a few years into the immediate post-war period due to the USAAF's problems in developing a useful jet-powered night-slash-all-weather fighter. Shortly after the war, a Black Widow was used in early American ejection seat experiments. The P-61 was heavily involved in the Thunderstorm project from 1946 to 1949, a landmark effort to gather data on thunderstorm activity. The project was a joint effort by four U.S. government agencies. The U.S. Weather Bureau and the NACA assisted by the U.S. Army Air Forces and Navy. Scientists from several universities also helped the launch, design, and conduct of the project. 
which aim to learn more about thunderstorms and how to better protect civil and military airplanes from them. The P-61's radar and particular flight characteristics enabled it to find and penetrate the most turbulent regions of a storm, and returned crew and instruments intact for detailed study. Surviving aircraft were offered to civilian governmental agencies, or declared surplus and offered for sale on the commercial market. Five were eventually issued civil registrations. The P-61 was, in fact, a remarkable response to the mission set for it, but that mission had already changed before it got into combat. Northrop, a small manufacturer that rose to meet the challenge, did an amazing job of building a sophisticated, new technology airplane that had no precedent. They didn't adapt an earlier design to become a night fighter or base the P-61 on anything that already existed. They started with a clean sheet of paper and invented the first all-weather day-night interceptor. In that sense, it was the beginning of today's anytime, anywhere, 24-hour U.S. Air Force. It was the start of something else big, too. Oddball speciality air framer Northrop aircraft, one small enough that it could be given the night fighter assignment without disturbing the work of such long-gone industry giants as Republic and North American, is today as the Northrop Grumman Corporation, the fifth largest defense contractor in the world. This is the P-61, called the Black Widow. She's well-named because she packs four caliber 50 machine guns and four 20 millimeter cannon. An obituary notice goes with each bite. Those twin engines will carry her fast enough to catch up with almost anything in the sky. And she's maneuverable, as a fighter should be. Very easy to handle. She stalls, takes off, and lands at low speeds. Getting checked out on her is a pleasure. The Black Widow flies the skies in three sleek models. First, the YP-61, the earliest model of this ebony killer. Then the P-61A, the first model to go into combat service. And finally, the P-61B, the newest combat version. Let's watch this pilot learning his stuff on a P-61A. The first thing to do is familiarize yourself with a cockpit. Learn where all the controls and gauges are located. The TO for the airplane is a big help. Diagrams and photographs make it easy for you to get to know the ship. After a couple of hours of study, you are able to pick out the controls and gauges without the loss of a second. And with your eyes shut. That's important because you can't afford to waste time in this fast twin-engine job. And there's no co-pilot around to help you. You're going up for a ride, just to get the feel of the ship. But first, you have to check the airplane, thoroughly. That's your best guarantee for living to a ripe old age. Like most airplanes equipped with tricycle landing gear, the 61 has a nose gear towing pin. Check it, as the nose wheel may shimmy on takeoff and become damaged. Check the nose wheel pin cap. Be sure it's on tight. Then check the rest of the landing gear for inflation of the tire and general condition. The red mark shows whether the tire is slipped on the rim. The strut ought to be extended about four inches. And another item not to be forgotten is the pressure in the emergency landing gear system. There's a gauge in each wheel well. It should show 700 pounds per square inch for the nose gear. Repeat the same inspection on the other two wheels. No cuts or bruises. Tread's okay. No slippage. Strut clean and extended around four inches. And the emergency pressure? 750 pounds per square inch for the main landing gear. Now to give the exterior of the plane a general going over. Skin's all right. 
No loose rivets or dents. Antenna mounted securely. De-icer boots okay. No rips or places where oil or gasoline has been spilled. Gun bay doors tight. Control surfaces in good shape. All hatches and doors must be closed and locked. Otherwise, they'll blow open and probably off when the plane's in the air. So each one should be checked. The radar operator's top hatch, rear entrance door. Now you can get into the cockpit. But you have to climb right out again through the top hatch. Careful not to step on any plexiglass. There's one thing more to check outside the airplane. The gas tank filler caps. Two on each side and oil cap. Make sure they're fastened tightly in place. Here's an old story, but a wise one. Form 1A. Check and sign for red diagonals. Turn on the circuit breakers behind the gunner's seat. And make sure the gunner's escape hatch is closed and locked. From now on, you are in command of the airplane. What would you do now? Well, you know the answer to that from studying the tech order. Turn on the generators, then more circuit breakers, the ones for the starters and fuel booster pumps, and the light circuit breakers. Now look around the cockpit to see if everything is in order. Nothing loose. No tools or papers to foul up the controls. Instruments, okay. The controls, and that includes the throttles, are locked. Unlock and try them out. Operate the rudders, elevators. Put ailerons through their complete range. Notice that those ailerons are unusual? They're the spoiler type, especially effective at high speeds. The P-61 is the only airplane in the Army Air Forces that has them. Controls are all okay. See if all the controls and switches are set properly. Open throttles one-fourth to one-third. Prop control switches in automatic. Feathering switches normal. Test the prop circuit breakers to make sure the buttons are in. Check fuel in all tanks. Fuel valves set to outboard tanks. Cross feed, which supplies both engines from one tank, off. Air pressure for the emergency brakes ought to be 425 to 450 pounds per square inch. Check the clock against your watch and the altimeter. Oxygen pressure, 425 pounds per square inch. Oxygen regulator to auto mix on. Test the trim tabs. If they're in good working order, set them for takeoff. Now the instructor is ready to take over. While the ground crew pulls props through 12 blades, set the superchargers at neutral and throttles one fourth to one third open. Adjust both mixture controls to idle cutoff. Props at full increase RPM. Check to see that the props are clear. Then turn on the battery switches. On the P61A, there are two individual battery switches and a master battery switch. The master switch on the ignition unit is for ignition only. Turn booster pumps to low. Carburetor air cold. Oil shutters one-third open. Make sure all cowl flaps are open and the intercooler flaps closed. Automatic pilot oil pressure off. Make sure that the VHF switches are off. Check carburetor air filter. Turn on master ignition switch and the right switch to both. Energize the starter and then prime the engine in the last five seconds of energizing. 
Since a putt-putt is furnishing your power, you should energize for no longer than 10 seconds before flipping the switch to mesh. If you are using the battery, the maximum energizing period would be 20 seconds. Don't energize beyond those limits or you'll damage the starter. When the putt-putt is being used, only your main battery switch should be on. Turn on the other switches when the crew chief disconnects the putt-putt. Adjust your mixture control to auto-rich. Close the throttle to run your engine as slowly as possible until oil pressure is indicated. As soon as oil pressure shows, up to between 1,000 and 1,200 RPM to prevent fouling of the plugs as a consequence of prolonged idling. Now we're ready to run through the same procedure for the left engine. Throttle to between 600 and 700 RPM until the oil pressure gauges indicate a steady pressure. The cold oil pressure will go up to 150 or 200 pounds until the oil temperature gets to 40 or 50 degrees centigrade. Keep the prop governor in high RPM. Turn the fuel booster pumps off. Your fuel pressure should be between 15 and 17 pounds. When the oil temperature gets to about 40 degrees centigrade, open the oil cooler flaps about one third. Keep the engine cowl flaps open. Operate the cowl flaps and intercooler flaps watching them from the window. Operate the oil cooler flaps and check the gauge. Check both hydraulic pressure gauges. Make your interphone check and see that all entrance hatches are closed and locked. Okay to taxi to runway 29. Use taxi strip directly in front of you. Runway 29, roger. brakes for taxiing as little as possible. This holds good for any two-engined airplane. And when you want to turn, use your outboard engine. Always taxi with your flaps up set brakes and proceed to make check. Your oil pressure should be at normal and cylinder head temperature must be over 100 degrees. Now check one engine at a time. See that the prop is at high RPM and put mixture control in auto rich. Open your throttle briefly to about 40 inches to clean the engine out. Then reduce manifold pressure to 30 inches. RPM should be from 1950 to 2100. Check your ammeter. It ought to show charge. Next, turn off one magneto. Your loss of RPM should not exceed 100. Now make a quick check on the other mag. Running an engine at high manifold pressure on one mag may cause serious detonation. Next, test the prop circuit breakers. Pull the prop governor control lever back from its high RPM setting until it drops 200. Advance the prop control to the original setting. Use the feather switch to check the prop. 
When RPM starts to drop, switch back to normal position. Put the prop selector switch in decrease. As soon as RPM drops 200, move the switch to increase. When the RPM goes back to 2100, put the switch in automatic. Now go through the same procedure for the other engine. And then you're ready for the final check. Fuel booster pumps at high. Fuel pressure between 15 and 19 pounds per square inch. Prop circuit breakers down. Prop switches at automatic. Prop controls at high RPM. Mixture auto rich. Intercooler flaps closed. Upper cowl flaps closed. Lower cowl flaps open about one quarter. Wing flaps one third down. Gyro instruments uncaged. Oil temperature should be between 40 and 90 degrees centigrade. Oil pressure 75 to 90 pounds per square inch at 2,000 RPM. Cylinder heads between 120 to 205 degrees centigrade. Hydraulic and accumulator pressure 800 to 1,100 pounds per square inch. Now you're ready to scramble. Yes, the P61A takes off like a homesick angel. But flying the P61B is smoother and even more efficient, with these latest modifications giving her top performance. A rack for night binoculars, a new wrinkle in night fighting, an electrically operated accessory panel, push-button type circuit breakers, two improved heating units, trim tab removed from aileron, landing gear with a neutral position. In the down position, a lock prevents the gear from being raised accidentally. Main gear nacelle doors close with wheels down. Taxi lights on the nose wheel. Now let's go upstairs and watch another P61 go through its paces. A YP in this case. The ship takes off at about 105 miles an hour indicated without flaps. She'll fly herself off the ground. But now let's see how the P61 takes off with flaps. Using quarter flaps provides another normal takeoff. Notice that the nose need be raised very little. But if you ever have to take off from a bombed field in a hurry, use two-thirds flaps. Keep nose wheel on ground until you have flying speed, then pull her loose. Climb a few feet and level off to gain speed. The P-61 will take off in a short space if you handle it correctly. Here's another way to clear an obstacle at the end of the runway. Flaps down two-thirds again. But this time, stay on the ground as long as possible, gaining all the speed you can. Then pull up steeply and keep climbing until the obstacle is cleared. 140 miles per hour gives you the best rate of climb, but 160 is generally recommended for normal operation. The higher speed keeps the engine running cooler. For normal cruising, use 2,230 RPM or less. Manifold pressure, 29 to 34 and a half inches in auto lean. Oil temperature, 60 to 85 degrees centigrade. Oil pressure, 60 to 90 pounds per square inch. Fuel pressure, 15 to 17 pounds per square inch. Cylinder head temperature, about 210 degrees centigrade. Generator voltage, 28 to 28 and a half. Amps, 200 maximum each when using turret and all radio equipment. Shift the supercharger every three hours to prevent accumulation of sludge. The widow is very easy to get along with. She won't give you any trouble on turns. Climbs like a monkey. Dives well. Here she is doing a chandelle. A stall at about 95 miles per hour with flaps up and power off. The response and effectiveness of elevator and rudders is completely normal. Elevator forces are exceptionally light for a ship of its size due to the spring-loaded tabs. Failure of either engine in flight isn't a problem if you follow the proper procedure. Hit the feathering switch, then close the throttle. Move the mixture control to idle cutoff. Turn the fuel supply of the dead engine off. Snap the ignition switch off after the prop stops rotating. Put the live engine in auto-rich. 
and trim your rudder tab. Close the cowl flaps on the dead engine all the way. And finally, close the oil cooler flaps and intercooler shutter on the dead engine. Even when stalled on one engine, the Black Widow isn't in trouble. On one engine, you can turn in either direction if you maintain safe single engine airspeed. Have your plane trimmed properly and remember coordination. And don't be timid about racking her around. You can even do vertical banks into the dead engine if you keep her at proper flying speed. To unfeather is equally simple. Turn the ignition switch on with the throttle closed. Set the prop control lever to the decrease RPM position. Turn on the fuel supply. Move the mixture control to auto rich. Set the feathering switch to normal position and hold the selector switch in the increase RPM until your engine speed reaches 800 RPM. Then release the selector switch. When minimum engine operating temperatures have been reached, place selector switches in automatic. And finally, adjust mixture, throttle, and prop levers to the desired power and engine RPM and retrim the ship. In case of both fuel and booster pump failure on one of the engines, turn on cross-feed valve and the booster pump of the operating engine to high. If, in an emergency, you need the absolute maximum performance, use the water injection which is found on most P61s. Just shove the throttles all the way open. That turns on the pumps. And then push the water injection switch. That sends the water into the engine. To use the autopilot, turn on the pressure valve. Pressure should be between 100 and 125 pounds per square inch. Trim the ship so it'll fly hands off. Uncage the gyro pilot instruments. Line up the control indices. First the rudder. Then the aileron. And last, the elevator. Set the speed valve at two or three. Now turn on the autopilot. And finally, if necessary, readjust the indices for level flight. I guess we've been up long enough. Let's head for the barn. Turn the autopilot and cockpit heaters off. Check to see that de-icer and anti-icer are off. Turret stowed. Fuel to fullest tank. Cross feed valve off. Mixture auto rich. Fuel booster pumps high. Supercharger neutral. When airspeed drops below 175, lower gear and check it. Hydraulic and accumulator pressure, 800 to 1,100 pounds per square inch. Props, automatic and set for 2,400 RPM. And 
lower your flaps. Retrim the elevators. Check brake pressure with your toe. Approach at not less than 110 miles an hour. Touch down at about 90 miles an hour. Tail down. That was a landing with three quarter flaps. Let's go back and look at some other types. If you want to use less runway, for example, just lower the flaps all the way. Remember, you have a lot more drag with full flaps, so come in with a little more power. The P-61 was designed with a large area of flaps for slow landings at night. If you're forced to land on a short runway, make a power approach. Use full flaps and fly the airplane quite slowly. You'll have to keep considerable power to prevent stalling, but the ship will get down in less than a thousand feet this way. For a single engine landing, bank into the good engine if practicable when you enter the traffic pattern. Lower the wheels just after you turn into the approach, but don't lower the flaps until you're sure of making the field. Use some power on the good engine. Try to make your approach as normal as possible. If you're going faster than normal, fly the plane onto the ground and use the brakes rather than holding it off to lose the excess speed. Some pilots prefer to make a landing with no power. It may be done with full flaps. The glide must be quite steep in order to maintain airspeed, and the flare should be started rather high so the plane won't mush into the ground. But now let's see what happens after the wheels are on the ground. Hold the nose off the ground as long as possible in order to spare the brakes. After you complete the landing run and come to a stop, be sure the cowl flaps are open and raise the wing flaps. Idle the engines at 1,000 to 1,200 RPM until cylinder head temperatures drop below 205 degrees centigrade. Mixture should be auto-rich and all cowl flaps open. Advance throttle to 25 inches and pull her back, cleaning out the engine. Now move the mixture to idle cutoff and advance throttles to full open as the engines die. Turn off all switches. Hold brakes until chucks are under each wheel, then release. Finally, lock the controls. Well, that ends your first lesson in learning how to fly the Black Widow. You have a long way yet to go, but it's usually a case of love at first flight. She's that kind of an airplane. The Black Widow is designed to kill. The fury of her guns and the flaming wrecks of her victims are lighting up dark skies over enemy strongholds. To you who will fly her at night in hard-hitting air battles, we say good luck and good hunting. And Bolin, and I'm the moderator today. We're talking about, repeat after me, Lancaster. No, Lancaster. Very good. My good friend, uh, Air Vice Marshal Ron Dick, was supposed to do this program today, and he couldn't make it. So I've been practicing my British accent uh, for you today. And he told me Jaguar and Lancaster. So with that in mind, I'd like to introduce Mr. Dave Rohr. Dave is the CEO of the Canadian Warplane Heritage Museum in Hamilton. And Dave's going to introduce our guest. Dave. 
Thank you, Dan. Well, good afternoon, and uh, I want to tell you that uh, it's a great honor for the Canadian Warplane Heritage Museum in Hamilton, Ontario, to be able to bring uh, to you in Oshkosh and AirVenture 2006, one of only two flying Lancasters in the world. And uh, we haven't been here in 17 years, and uh, we thought it was time. And uh, we were able to do that through the the uh, great cooperation from the EAA in Oshkosh and also the EAA in, uh, in the Canadian chapters in Alberta and Nanton, which is, uh, has a tent right behind us. And they were able to uh, fundraise and help us uh, fly this airplane here. It only uses about 240 gallons an hour or so, uh, and that's not to say anything about the maintenance. So, But uh, we're also honored not only to be here, but to be able to bring with us uh, five veterans who flew Lancasters in World War II. And uh, these gentlemen uh, uh, are here today. I'm going to tell you a little bit about each one of them. And I'm going to uh, obviously give them a chance to say a few things. And also, they'll be available to answer any questions you might have of them. And uh, I want to say that uh, this effort has been a, a big undertaking for us and the cooperation uh, of these gentlemen to make this come true. Uh, has been very much appreciated by us. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to just start on our left. Uh, one of our co-captains flying the Lancaster today is our chief pilot at the museum, Captain Gary Schroeder uh, from uh, Fergus, Ontario. And uh, so welcome, Gary. And he can tell you what it's like flying a Lancaster 60-some-odd uh, years later. <laughs> Our first veteran is uh, Flying Officer Joe English. I'm just going to put this book, if you take the black part, I'll take the paper underneath, thanks. Uh, Flying Officer uh, Joe English was a pilot, uh, joined the uh, RCAF in October of uh, 42 in Regina, Saskatchewan. And if you want to know what the American equivalent of Regina is, it's Wichita. Okay. <laughs> it's on the road to nowhere and it's colder than hell in the winter. So uh, he did his pilot training in, in Regina on Tiger Moss and then uh, went to uh, the uh, service flight training school uh, in Brandon, Manitoba, where he trained on uh, Cessna crane T-50 cranes, uh, receiving his RCAF wings in November of 43. Was posted overseas at Liverpool in April of 44 and uh, trained on Oxford's. Uh, in England, and then uh, went to Wellington's, or the Wimpy Bomber, uh, Wimpies as they called them, affectionately, right, Joe? And uh, and it was mated with his crews. Then went into uh, uh, four-engine conversion on Halifax bombers, and then eventually to Lank uh, Finishing School, joining 625 Squadron in uh, Kelstern, England, and then that when that base was condemned, <laughs> you moved to Scrampton, England. Uh, Joe completed 30 operational missions on Lancasters. Following his operational tour, he also flew the Lancaster on two mana drops, one into The Hague, dropping food, and one into Rotterdam, dropping food, before being repatriated to Canada and attending the uh, University of Manitoba and uh, became a professional architect in, uh, in Edmonton, Alberta. Thank you, Joe. We're glad you're here. Uh, 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 Our next gentleman is uh, Dr. Robert Hanna, and uh, Bob, as we call him. Uh, he uh, wanted to join the Air Force. Uh, he was born in St. Catharines, Ontario. He wanted to join the Air Force in uh, April of 41, but he uh, didn't have the prerequisite education at the time. And uh, I don't mean this as a slight to the Army, but the Army accepted him. So <laughs> he went to... <laughs> He went to the 10th Battery uh, in St. Catharines, where after a year of service, he was able to um, join the Air Force. And he was in the uh, stream to become a fighter pilot. Uh, he went, uh, he, he, uh, went to nine elementary flight training school in St. Catharines on Tiger Moth aircraft. And then he went to uh, the service flight school in Elmer, where he got his wings on Harvard's, or what we call Harvard's, but what you call Texans. And uh, then he was um, posted overseas and uh, went uh, basically uh, to advanced uh, flying unit at uh, Stratford-on-the-Avon. 
and flew Oxfords, uh, which was similar to a T-50 aircraft. Uh, did some other training beam courses and things like that. Then he went on to 18 uh, uh, AFU at Smithers Field, where he was at Snitters Field, where he was assigned to Wellingtons and picked up his crews. Then he went on to uh, heavy conversion unit uh, on Sterling's at uh, 653 heavy conversion unit. From there, he was posted to 514 squadron and uh, went to Lancaster conversion and uh, was posted eventually to 115 squadron where he flew uh, on Lancasters. Uh, he completed operations on Lancasters in August of 44. He completed 28 operational missions. Uh, when you get a chance to talk to Bob, he has his mission operation map from his 15th mission, which was uh, a mission to downtown Berlin. And it's quite an exciting mission. Uh, and he has the actual uh, map and briefing uh, of that mission, and he'd certainly uh, be able to discuss and show you that. It's, it's very interesting. Uh, they didn't have GPS, I can tell you that. And then uh, he also, after uh, completing the mission, uh, he did two mana drops into Hague, and then he uh, also went into France and uh, Juvencourt, France, and he brought home uh, our POWs. Uh, from France and brought uh, one load of 24 POWs back in uh, Lancaster and back into England. And uh, he said that was one of the more precious trips he did because he said uh, after you survived the POW experience, he said uh, if you're sitting in the back, you didn't want some young pilot to crash now <laughs> and, and end your wartime experience coming home. So, uh, but we're very glad to have uh, Dr. Hanna. After the war, he came back and went to dentistry school at the University of Toronto and uh, retired as a, as a dentist uh, a few years ago. I, I tried to memorize all this, but it, I've got a good memory, but it's short. Uh, our next uh, honored guest is Flight Lieutenant Chris Parr, uh, DFC, DFM, who joined the British Air Force as a volunteer uh, reserve in August of 37 to train as a reserve pilot. Uh, Chris was called out automatically for wartime when the war broke out in September 39 and was sent to France to serve until uh, that time in Dunkirk. And he was in the Dunkirk evacuation uh, of the European continent. And he flew Blenheims, and they did uh, auto grass fields, they did leaflet drops, and, and uh, other missions like that. And Chris will tell you a little bit about the progression, because Chris was in the war from 1939 to 1945 as a pilot. He, uh, following the, the breakout of war, uh, he came back to England in Bomber Command, serving in many capacities, and uh, completed two operational tours, uh, 58 sorties and uh, during which he was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross and the DFM and the Air Efficiency Award. The remainder of the time was spent on administration, instructing and additional training and respite in Canada and also trying to raise funds for the war by the war bond effort back home. He served on four squadrons flying Blenheims, Hamptons and Lancasters. At the conclusion of the war, while waiting discharge, they tried to talk him into uh, going to uh, finishing school for senior officers, and uh, he declined and repatriated to Canada, and uh, we're glad you did, Chris, and we're glad you're here. Thank you. The next gentleman uh, is uh, Warrant Officer Eric Groh, and uh, he is the only flying NCO pilot that we have in the group here. And Eric was born in London, England, educated in London and Kent. Uh, he was uh, in survey and building studies uh, when, when the war broke out in 1939. He joined the Royal Air Force. He flew uh, a number of uh, different airplanes to eventually check out on the Lancaster. He was uh, shot down in the Lancaster on, a bo on the bombing run into Berlin. And uh, which was his uh, fifth mission. Only 5% of all air crew shot down in a Lancaster survived. He survived being shot down over Berlin. And not only that, he also then survived a prisoner war camp for over two years. Uh, Eric then, uh, after the war, came back 
to Canada and uh, worked with the federal public service and until uh, he retired in 79. He joined our establishment in 1976 and he coordinates and runs our, our flow and envelopes program where we have uh, envelopes of various airplanes stamped by crews that fly them and, and uh, runs a very successful program which helps us financially. And uh, he also was uh, helped uh, one, of our, uh, one of our members who when we were able to get this airplane in 1988 and help restore it to fly in, in 1998 uh, he helped Bill Randall quite a bit in that exercise. Um, he flew Tagger Moss, Oxfords, Hamptons, Blenheims, Wellingtons, and Lancasters on 166 Squadron. As I said, he was shot down on the 23rd of November, 43. And uh, he was, a. Uh, after the war ended, he was held prisoner by the Russians for until they did an exchange. And the way they exchanged uh, until uh, at the end of the war was one for one. So uh, one, one, one Russian being held by the Allies and one ally being held by the Russians and across the uh, El Elbe River. So uh, Eric is with us and we're glad that uh, he was able to uh, uh, get through that experience. Okay. Our last guest of honor and uh, I, want, I want to tell you, I'm really proud of these gentlemen because uh, you know what the heat was like yesterday and, uh, and, and these guys are troopers. I mean, uh, we've had pretty long days and, uh, you know, they're up early in the morning ready to go before we are. And uh, they're there at 10 o'clock at night having their nightcap <laughs> and uh, we're trying to keep up with them. So, but um, our last gentleman is not a pilot, but he is a, he's a gunner, air gunner, and that's Les, Leslie Weeks. Now, Leslie joined the uh, Royal Air Force in 1941, and uh, he joined as a ground armorer and completed a uh, course to, to uh, uh, be an armament technician, basically, at Spitfires and 91 Squadron, which was at uh, Hawkskinge, Kent, which was the closest British base to Calais where the Germans were. Uh, he was posted to the Middle East in e Egypt in 1942. He worked on Halifax and Wellington bombers. He applied for air crew status and was trained as an air gunner at El Bala, Egypt. Trained on the Avril Anson, posted the 76 operational training unit on Wellingtons as a tail gunner. Converted to the B-24 Liberator, which is behind us, as a mid-upper gunner. Was uh, posted to Italy in 1944, stationed at the uh, east coast on uh, Amendola on 178 Squadron on the Adriatic Sea. Flew missions as a mid-upper gunner, uh, basically targeting the marshalling and railway yards as the Germans were trying to retreat uh, to northern Italy. They were trying to uh, interfere and uh, make that retreat more difficult. In England, uh, he was posted back to England in 1944, and uh, in December 44, where he was assigned duties as a rear gunner on the Lancaster, and uh, served in that capacity until the end of the war. He flew 21 missions. And uh, an interesting thing about uh, Leslie was uh, when he was 18 years old, living with his family in London, England, uh, one night uh, in September, for those that remember, and I'm sure there's many here that do, but September 7th, 1940 was the first huge bombing of London, England. And it happened about four o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, on October 1940, at about... Uh, quarter to one in the morning, uh, Eric's uh, family lived down by the dockyards, which was a target in, uh, for London, and uh, his home was bombed, and uh, Eric uh, lost his mother and his dad, uh, lost his older brother, his older sister, and uh, younger brother and younger sister, and brother-in-law in that bombing, and, uh, and he survived uh, that bombing, and uh, Basically, uh, at 18 years old, uh, the war changed his life significantly, and, and he really didn't have a family anymore after that. And uh, so he, uh, in deciding what he wanted to do with his life and where he should go, uh, he joined the, uh, the RAF subsequent to that. And uh, one thing that uh, Leslie wanted me to tell you was that he, he didn't do it out of, uh, out of revenge or anything like that. He, he did it because as a young man, 
it was a it was something it was a direction for him to pursue and so he he did that and we're glad you did Leslie so thank you for being here thank you Dave for a great introduction go ahead drip on me that would be an honor Gary um, give us an overview what it is like to fly to Lancaster and tell us a little bit about this airplane. I believe this is one of two, right? Yeah, that's correct. There's uh, another one that's still part of the Royal Air Force based in Coningsby, England, and it's still a military airplane. So this is the only civilian registered Lancaster in the world. Uh, to fly it? Wow, it's the greatest privilege of my career. It's, um, it's kind of difficult to explain what it feels like because you feel like there's, there's thousands of others that came before us that are, are really still up there with us. It's a uh, it's a heavy airplane uh, compared to a lot of the aircraft that will be here um, that you'll see at Oshkosh. But you get used to it pretty quick. It's, it's very similar uh, to a DC-3. Uh, we say it's like flying the DC-3, only it's meaner. And well, you know, four Merlins in close formation here. Uh, what a sound. I've never heard anything like it. Yeah, we say it's the most efficient way of turning money into noise. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's uh, extremely noisy. The noisiest airplane I've ever flown with. You cannot communicate without... Um, uh, interphones. As soon as the engines are started, you cannot talk to each other. You can't even scream at each other. I mean, that's a good thing. You know, I'm a very fortunate guy. I'm, I'm able to fly the EAs B-17 here, aluminum overcast. And, and every place we go, we meet veterans. And uh, it's a very emotional thing for them. Uh, they got a tear in their eye, and uh, they want to tell us their story. So without further ado, let's start right down the line here. And Let's hear some war stories. Tell us, tell us your best war story. Uh, yeah, hold the mic right up at the top there. Yeah, let's, let's hear about what it's like to fly the Lancaster in combat. Well, the nearest I got to a, a real serious uh, incident was coming back from uh, a trip to Munich. Munich. Uh, we were running into a lot of bad weather. And for some reason, our good old Lancaster was eating up petrol like crazy. That's gas. Yeah. And um, so we, as a crew, we had to decide just when we were getting near the French coast whether we should try for England or not. And the engineer, my uh, engineer Jack Mundy, was a real crackerjack at this. And he had us on, very, uh, on the best arrangement of RPM and uh, boost and so on. And we all we decided that we'd go for England, and we would head for the uh, Manston Airport, which was right on the on the south coast of England, uh, the nearest uh, auxiliary or uh, uh, what would you call that? Um, oh, the place to land when you're in trouble. That's where we were. So we we did. We made it. We didn't have a huge amount of gas left, and uh, they had this. Uh, hold, uh, hold it real close. Fido. Yeah. They call it Fido. Uh, few, uh, fog intensive dispersal of that's <laughs> is that correct? Yeah, Fido, and uh, that was lit. It was a big string of gas gas pipes that were lit in case of fog, and we needed that because the the front was coming through. We we're running out of gas, and the North Sea didn't look very very uh, hospitable. So we we did get in. And I, I went over, over the perimeter track of the edge of the airport at about 200 miles an hour, but it was a big airport, thank God. And we, we, if I had lost my motors at that time, I would have at least glided in. Anyway. So that was the most exciting thing. Thank you very much. Pass the mic, mic down. Let's go right down the line here. We know the airplane is a, a night bomber. That's why it's painted black on the bottom and, and sort of a dark camouflage on the top. You guys operated at night with one pilot. Uh, what's that correct. like? I mean, that's well, unbelievable. Before I tell you any experiences, I want to say it's a great pleasure to be able to speak to people that are interested in coming here and honoring us. It's a tremendous thrill. Um, I'd also like to thank the Canadian Warplane Heritage and David Rohr for all the hospitality they've exhibited to us and the people in the tent 
from Alberta where Joe uh, got uh, honored by them also, yes. And um, they've just been wonderful. Now, about flying the Lancaster, um, I'm just going to tell you this one trip. Uh, it's I told it several times, but uh, we were my 15th mission uh, was to Berlin. Well, when you heard the name Berlin, you automatically got uh, sort of wound up. Uh, you knew that was going to be a long and probably a difficult trip. Well, and my the ground crew that was servicing the aircraft that I'd flown in 14 missions, I became very accustomed to this plane, and it was uh, scrubbed because they were changing the exhaust stubs, which they felt weren't uh, restricting the glow enough, and that would be make you more vulnerable in the sky. So they <coughs> got me into an alternate aircraft, and right away, being sort of superstitious, this unnerved me as well as the crew. So we got in the plane, and we had trouble getting the port inner started. And they had what they call trolley acts. That's an English way of saying they got a cart full of accumulators or batteries. They, they have a whole different uh, way of talking. Uh, so I said, you, they're going to bring a cart full of batteries and try to get this thing started. So we got it started. And um, right away, I was late in uh, getting uh, out to the caravan and get the oldest late to go. And there was a plane ahead of me that had just gone slightly off the perimeter track and buried the port wheel in some mud. And they were pulling it out. And I said, oh my God, what the hell else can go wrong? And I haven't even got out to the end of the runway yet. So we finally got airborne and uh, we climbed up. Our bombing height was 18,000 feet at 10,000 feet because these aircraft are supercharged. They have two stage blowers on them, M and S gear. And I get up to 10,000 feet, which you normally throttle back and put in the S gear of the blower, and it didn't engage. So that means that I'm going to be flying much lower than the altitude prescribed, which uh, is not a good thing either. And uh, we were called a straggler because we were late and we were uh, flying at a lower altitude. So we didn't, uh, we weren't so far very happy about the trip. Um, we got uh, between Magdeburg and Potsdam on the run into uh, Berlin and uh, a bright blue white light came on the aircraft, which was a master beam of searchlights. And then uh, the uh, other searchlights came in and coned you there. And that makes you very vulnerable for uh, fighter attacks, flak, and being lower, you're getting all the bombs from the people coming in on top of you. Not a very enviable position. So the only way to get out of this, I dove the thing down uh, to try to get out of the light, which brought me down around 5,000 feet. To, and they, they had to reassure the crew that I'm going to eventually pull out. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Anyway, there was a terrible thud. And the aircraft was shaking like mad. And uh, a piece of flak had caught the left port wingtip. And uh, later on, we discovered it blew off one of the blades of the propeller, which put it out of serious balance. As you know. <laughs> yeah. So we were able to get the engine feathered and got in and uh, got the crew settled down. My, uh, Bob Eamon was nervous. He threw out the window 
every that strips of tin foil that we used to foil the or jam the radar doesn't help you a hell of a lot. The guys coming behind that benefit. But anyway, he would have thrown me out if he could have got me out of the chair. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So we did make it back. Safely. Obviously. Thank you. I want to. So that that's. Uh, I have um, uh, the target map, which if anybody is interested in seeing the tactics that are laid down and the way we were, we never went directly to the target. You got diverted so the fighters would go up and intercept you there and you go to another city and so on. So uh, if anybody's interested, they might come over and see me later. I have the map. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Before we move on, I want to recognize the uh, reenactors standing behind these gentlemen. Uh, guys, come up here front and center. I want you to, everybody to see the authentic RAF gear that these guys have on. And uh, we're also going to give their, them permission to come out of their uniform of the day a little bit if they want to, to cool off. But this is all the authentic RAF gear, the fur-lined boots, uh, the beautiful Mae West, uh, the fur-lined jackets and parachutes and so forth. Uh, you notice they have the oxygen mass, authentic uh, electro, electrical connectors, the microphones in the mask, and of course the whistle is if you're in the water, this is to signal to your other crew members so you can be picked up. But thank you guys for coming, and we appreciate it. Thank you. I take those jackets off. I know you're burning up. Dave, I'm going to let you continue, if you would. And thank you, uh, Dan. Uh, now I'd like to uh, ask uh, Flight Lieutenant Chris Parr uh, to say a few words. Uh, Chris, uh, as I said earlier, served from 1939 to 1945. So for the entire war effort, uh, Chris was in the Royal Air Force and uh, uh, flew uh, 58 operational missions. Go ahead, Chris. Are we all right? Well, after that long-winded uh, explanation of what you did, you never did thank me. That's all I've been doing. <laughs> I didn't know. Keep it short now. <laughs> I didn't know what the format was going to be uh, here, so uh, uh, because I can't remember what I had for yesterday morning breakfast, I don't know how I could remember something that happened 65 years ago. Particularly if I've, uh, I have suffered from a bit of a syndrome from that war, and uh, I've hesitated to talk about it for many, many, many years. This is my first chance, shall I say. I wrote it all down because of my memory, but uh, also because I'm the only one you'll notice that was quite prepared to put his experience in writing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but again, I, I had a whole list of comparisons here, but I'll just start with the first one and then tell you a story. Uh, at the tender age of 18 then, with adolescent romantic notions of being a knight of the air with white silk scarf flowing past his ears, I was introduced into, uh, called up and introduced into bombing command and a whole group of nationalities, individual fellows from all over the world for the formation of, of bomber command, the first bomber command. And uh, you got very little time to make friends because uh, the changes were so rapid, so very rapid. But as far as comparing the first and the last, the obvious place to begin is the changing pattern of a bombing sortie from 1940 to 1943, 4, 5. In 1940, of course, the individual crews, uh, because of the sparsity of uh, uh, aircraft def uh, enemy defenses, uh, weather, etc., that was given later on in briefing, uh, because of that sparsity, each crew was to Although we were given a general direction of route to a target, we planned our own route 
uh, by uh, simple navigational methods, and we attacked the target, uh, whatever the situation was when we reached it. I'm speaking, of course, of the amount of cloud, whether it was moonlit, uh, and so on. And we also planned our own bombing run. Now, consider that in 1943, January the 17th, my Lancaster aircraft was one of 1,300 that was collected in the skies over England. And the, the mass of aircraft covered an area 30 miles long and 10 miles wide. And of course, with such an armada, I have no other name for it, we had to be told how to fly, where to fly, the course to fly, the height to fly, the speed to fly, the uh, bombing course run over the target, and the precise moment of bombing. This, of course, uh, is obviously to uh, save uh, collisions. It also added that uh, in the first, uh, the beginning of the war, we were just concerned with night fighters, uh, air, uh, searchlights, balloons, unheard of later, and uh, anti-aircraft fire, of course. When you get 250 planes over a target at the same time, you're worried about collision, you're worried about slipstreams, you're worried about being bombed from somebody above you, because we were all told which height to fly. There was small time for a young mind to accommodate this in, in six years. Another comparison, of course, which leads me into my story, is the great advancement in, in, in communication between ground and air, uh, which developed rapidly with new innovations in, in the six years. Our most reliable form of communication, and I can sense your very skepticism now, is the lowly, or was the lowly carrier pigeon. Now my story. I was flying a, a Hamden bomber, which is just a twin engine bomber. We bombed Kiel, bombing Kiel. Now carrier pigeons were left to the rear gunner to bring on board the aircraft. And before they were brought on the aircraft, these pigeons, I don't know whether any of you are pigeon, homing pigeon fanciers, but they were hungry, they were not fed for a couple of days, and they were shown their mate with another pigeon to make it jealous. <laughs> <laughs> they were put into a cage, and because you may be diverted coming back, and you couldn't land at your own airfield, where there was pigeon loft to cater to pigeons, you might land at an aerodrome where there was no such thing. So they tied a large bag of kernel to the side of the cage to feed them if you were so diverted. Now, the rear gunner, who was supposed to have been briefed about all this, hadn't got a clue. All he knew was that he just had to carry those pigeons on board the aircraft, and he was very responsible for them. So we take off, and we're flying over the North Sea, going to bomb Kiel, and of course, while we're climbing to the height that uh, we wish to attain, the highest, uh, the rear gunner sat in the back. He was also a member of the, of the uh, squadron jazz orchestra, and he played the clarinet. And uh, so he took his clarinet with him on every flight in case he bailed out or he was a prisoner of war. This uh, would give him some form of uh, amusement and entertainment. I'll never forget what he was playing as we, as we climbed to height. I surrendered there. <laughs> We told the son of a bee to shut up and carry on. Now, now he's over the North Sea, flying in the dark with nothing to do. What do you think he did? 
fed the pigeons. <laughs> colonel after colonel after colonel. We left Kiel and were coming home and flying from across Denmark and were following the line of the Frisian Isles, which wraps around Holland, Denmark, and, uh, and down. And on the edge of the uh, Frisian Isles was a beacon flashing. So we thought we would shoot up this, strafe this bloody beacon. Down we go, get to about 10,000 feet, and then all hell broke loose. A whole line of searchlights shot up like a wall. A whole line of anti-aircraft fire with tracers shot up like a wall. And we had to fly through this damn thing because there was no way to evade it. We were hit. We were hit in the starboard engine and we were hit in the transmitter, uh, the, the receiver, the wireless operator's receiver. Now the engine's coughing, spluttering, spurting, and uh, it's obvious we're losing height. To cut a long, long story short, we were losing height, and the decision was, should we fly over to Belgium and land and bail out, or should we get, try to get back to England? The decision was, or ditch in the sea. The decision was to try and get back to England. Well, of course, we never made it. We ditched, we ditched in the sea. The aircraft floated for about approximately three minutes. The dinghy is released automatically by the sea water. The dinghy comes out. The navigator shouts to the gunner not to forget the bloody pigeons. He brings the pigeons and cut long story short, once again, lots of dehydration, lots of difficulty getting the, uh, the, the dinghy righted and climbing in wet through. And we're sitting there all alone, you see. Another aircraft, when we fired off the first flares, another aircraft did circle us, and we didn't know. Uh, well, we knew that somebody knew them where we were. But the navigator takes out a pigeon, and on a piece of rice paper, he writes out the crew's name, of course, and the position where we were. This was the original intent of a pigeon, of course, if you were shot down, to let your parents know that you were still safe. Throws the pigeon into the air, it circled twice, and came back and sat on the dinghy. <laughs> he got the second pigeon out and did the same damn thing and threw that one up. Landed on the dinghy. Now the four of us are sitting there with two pigeons. <laughs> Suddenly, out of a clear blue sky, a little voice says, they should go home, they're well fed. <laughs> <laughs> the navigator who had the very pistol to shoot flares into the air, pointed across the, the dinghy to the, to the gunner and said, if we don't get picked up, first we eat the pigeons, then we eat you. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Chris. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. And now, he's never told that story in the last four days that we've been here, but uh, we've heard a lot of good stories. And I'd like to introduce uh, Warrant Officer Eric Grove. And as you may remember in my introductory remarks, uh, Eric was shot down on the bombing run into Berlin on his fifth mission. I can't match Chris's story for humor, but I thought I might tell you something about what it's like to be shot down. Um, and as with Robert, I was on, a, on our way to Berlin. Uh, this is in November 1943, and it was pretty cold. And uh, I got right to Berlin at 21,000, 22,000 feet, more or less. And that reason, I'd done three Berlins in five nights. Now, Berlin trip was about six or seven hours. So that in five nights, I'd done something like 20 flying hours over Germany. I was pretty tired. Anyway, I was early that night, and when we got to Berlin, close to Berlin, between Potsdam and Berlin, uh, it was all dark. Now you must realize that flying, at war, flying over enemy territory at wartime, the ground was entirely black, 
There wasn't a single light anywhere. No vehicles, no houses, no factories, nothing. Everything was dark black. So here we are trying to look down to find out our, our aiming point on a dark night on a black ground. I decided that when we came up to the right time when we should have bombed, that we should bomb. There were 400 aircraft behind me coming up, and I really didn't fancy this thought, as Robert said, of circling with 400 aircraft coming on, that the risk of collision was a little too great. So perhaps I did the wrong thing, but I said to the bomb aimer, okay, we'll open the bomb doors and get everything ready so that as soon as we see the first flare go down and we know where the target is, we can drop our bombs and get the hell out of here. It was unhealthy staying over Berlin. I think it had something like 20,000 guns. So it was pretty unhealthy. Now that was probably by my, my mistake. So I opened the bomb doors and for the first time on that flight, when we normally flew like this to confuse the enemy radar fighters and guns and things, I flew straight and level for 60 seconds. And in that 60 seconds, the night fighter shot me from the tail to the nose, underneath, firing upwards. He killed the rear gunner, the mid-upper gunner. He knocked out this port engine, knocked it out, tipped it up at an angle, tipped it up. He knocked out all my internal communications. Now, you know you heard this airplane the other day. It's a noisy airplane. Can you imagine trying to shout, talk to one another over the noise of four engines? We had no communications at all. And he set the, he set the bombs on fire. That night I had a, a 4,000 pound high explosive and 6,000 pounds of magnesium incendiaries. And unfortunately the, the uh, incendiaries set the magnesium in the aeroplane also on fire. And so here we were sitting up in the sky at 23,000 feet on three engines with no defenses, no communications and a real beacon in the sky waiting for the other target, waiting as a target for some other night fighter to, um, to attack us. So I dived about five or 6,000 feet to try and blow out the flames, which is what the record book tells you to do. And of course, it, as the record book is usually wrong, it never didn't work. And so we stayed, in fact, it did the opposite. It just fanned the flames bigger. So I, I had a decision to make. And I'm talking to you for some minutes, but all this happened in the space of about 15 seconds. I had to decide as the captain and the pilot of the aircraft, and I was responsible for the crew. All we pilots were responsible for the safety of our crew. Should I attempt to fly to Sweden over the cold Baltic? This was November. The Baltic Sea would be very close to freezing. Should I try and get it down to Switzerland and climb over the mountains? It was weakly cold. Should I try and fly back to England for four hours against all the enemy defenses and so on? And I decided, and as I say, in a matter of 11 seconds, you could be surprised what runs through your head quickly when you need to. Now, I thought this was unhealthy, I'd better get out. So I gave the order to bail out, and the five of us who were remaining, the pilot, the engineer, the radio operator, the navigator, and the bomb aimer, we all got out safely and landed as a prisoner of war. And I spent two years as a prisoner of war, uh, came home on a stretcher, um, released by the Russians, as I said. That was another story, I won't go into that. But that was, that was my most outstanding event in, the, in World War II. Thank you, Eric. And uh, uh, Eric was telling me earlier, and I did mention it, that only 5% of crews that bailed out uh, that survived the, that experience, let alone being a prisoner of war. And uh, our, our last special honored guest today is uh, Leslie Weeks. Leslie uh, was a gunner, started as an armorer, and ended up air crew as a gunner. And uh, Leslie, could you uh, please tell us a bit of your experience? Well. Uh, two of mine were, when I used to do our um, in air training, I was at this place called El Bala and we trained on Avro Answers. They also decided there that we would do our dinghy drill on the Suez Canal because it was right alongside the Suez Canal. I don't know who thought of that one, but anyway, that's what they made us do. But this day we were down there doing a dinghy drill. A dinghy in those days was about a, a seven foot round dinghy. It was open. There was no cover to it. So it was just supposed to accommodate seven men, supposed to accommodate the whole crew, right? So we were down there doing this, and all of a sudden somebody shout out, ship coming, looks up the canal, there's this great big ship coming down the canal, and they usually push a kind of a wall of water ahead of them when they're, when they're coming down, when they're going through. And 
the dimensions of the Suez Canal is 100 miles long, it's 100 yards wide and 100 feet deep. It was built by Ferdinand de Lesseps, whose statue was at the top end, the Mediterranean end of the canal. But anyway, uh, knowing that this ship was coming down, we had to get out of the way. So uh, we, also, we also had uh, canvas paddles that you put over your hand. We only had two. So one guy would be uh, paddling one way and the other one's supposed to paddle the other way. But the other guy, we, we were paddling the both the same way. So the dinghy was only going round in circles and not moving anywhere. But luckily enough, uh, um, various distances down the canal, there's these steps that actually go down to the water. So if anything transpires, they're able to get down to water level without having to jump in. Uh, so that was one of them. The other one, um, we were doing a bombing raid on uh, Ferrara. That's uh, near the east, co uh, east coast of Italy on the Adriatic side. And uh, what we used to do, we used to bomb the marshalling yards. Uh, the marshalling yards, I think, there's a couple of tracks going in and a couple of tracks coming out. And then once the, once the rolling stock got in, then there was all these railroad tracks inside where they could store all the boxcars and stuff like this, okay, loaded with ammunition, bombs, whatever. So we used to close off both ends. We used to do what we called saturation raids. And we used to, uh, having closed off the, the two ends, the end, entrance and the exit, uh, we proceeded to drop 500 ton of bombs on what was inside so that we could destroy everything. The purpose of this was to stop the Germans gradually moving all this stuff out and taking it north as our army and our ground forces were pushing the north, eh? Pushing them out of Italy. So this was the, um, uh, uh, the idea and also the primary uh, need for what we did. But the problem is this night, we were bombing Ferrara on uh, September the 4th in 1944, and we made our run in over the target, and we, uh, we were coming out, turning around to come home, and the bomber says, uh, Skip, the bombs are still with us. So the skipper said to him, uh, I'll tell you the name of my skipper, is uh, William Waterton, but we used to call him Whiskey Waterton because he used to like to drink, you know. So um, uh, a bombardier said, Bomb, uh, Skip, the bombs are still with us. So Willie says to him, where were you, out to tea or something like this, you know? So he said, will we make a second run? So Skip said, yeah, we'll make a second run. And so... Um, we went in, and like Eric was saying, we went round for a second time, but you've got all these other bombers coming in behind you as well, and you know, could get into quite a collision with some of them, and guys above you dropping bombs as well. But anyway, we managed to go through, we did the second run, and we were heading for home, and the bombardier pipes up, and this was on a Liberator bomber, by the way. I'm sorry I didn't tell you that, but it was on a Liberator bomber, because I was a top gunner on Liberator bombers. Um, the bombardier pipes up, and he says, Skip, the bombs haven't gone. Will we go, will we go round again? And God, being Australian, it says, not bloody likely, he says, you know. <laughs> because, uh, as Eric will tell you, uh, sometimes the fighters used to wait for you coming out so they could grab, you know, with all the searchlights going around. If the searchlights cone you, then you've got quite a little job to get away from them. They were pretty good at doing that. And, uh, but anyway, eventually, uh, the skipper decided that we would try and get rid of them on the way home, but we're, it, it took us halfway home before we was able to get lose those bombs because they were fixed up there. And one thing about the Liberator, you could stand in the bomb bay and uh, the bombardier could have a look at it, see what the problem was. But eventually we did get them away. But when you've got five ton of bombs sitting in your belly, you don't really want to take them home. <laughs> and they didn't think very much of it, taking the bombs home after you've gone all that way using the gas to get them there. <laughs> So another, right, that, I'll, that's the story now. Another thing is, uh, oh, our guys have gone. There's one thing that we haven't spoken about here, and that is the ground crews. Now, our guys here that look after this plane and our other planes at the museum, they're a really great bunch. And uh, particularly for this plane at the moment, uh, you, you cannot place a value on their dedication, their enthusiasm, and even their love for keeping this aircraft flying and our other aircraft flying. And we're, we're all volunteers, most of the volunteers. We do all this work. I'm still working full time. I'm 85, I still come work uh, full time. And I go up to the museum at weekends and we work there. We, we, um, we have visitors coming in, we have tours, we have weddings, we have all this sort of thing. But all the guys there that maintain the aircraft, if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be up there. We wouldn't be here. And it was the same during the war. 
the ground crews put in lots and lots of hours, you know, so that we could fly. And in pretty lousy conditions half the time. Thanks, Rick. That was a good one. This is true. And uh, especially winter time. If you can imagine working on the engines, one of these in winter time outside, very cold, cold metal and that, and working with bare hands, um, that is really a dedicated person, you know. And our guys here, and I say this, I know they won't like me saying this, but all the guys at house that look after our aircraft, they are really a great bunch. And also, uh, Dave here, our new chairman, is a great guy as well. And he's been a lot of running us around here, back to our, where we are uh, billeted, you know, and back to the airport, out to meals, coming back, and, you know. And there's some days here, he, I think he must be running 24 hours, on, uh, 24 hours a day. I don't know why, but he is. And thanks, Dave. That's very good. And we, we appreciate it. How many Canadians in the audience? British, British citizens, any British people here? Australians, I talked to a couple of Australians yesterday. All right, thank you. Any New Zealanders? Any Kiwis? All right, all you veterans, raise your hand, all you veterans. U.S. Thank you all. It takes a second. Okay. Since we're in business of making compliments and making odds and ends of them, I'd like to point out a couple of things as well. Our respected chairman, the big guy over here who stands six foot six, was also in the military. He served in the Royal Canadian Air Force, followed on where we left off. We have another, one of the Lancaster pilots who, who flies with us, Gary there. Uh, he's also served in the RCF and some of the ground crew served in the military. And I like to think that where we finished off, we left in good hands where these guys took over. That's another one. The other, the other point that I, the other point I'd like to make to follow, pick up where Liz was talking, is the maintenance of these aircraft at Canadian Warplane Heritage Museum. We have about 25 active aircraft, I think, none of which are less than 50 or 60 years old. Most of the maintenance is done, as Liz has said, by volunteers. But we have two or three permanent engineers. And if he's here, I hope he's here. He's our chief engineer, Dwayne Freeman. Is he here? Where is he? Dwayne? Well, he's a guy who keeps responsible for keeping 25 aircraft at the average age of 60 years old up in the air, trying to beat our equivalent of your FAA, Transport Canada, and keeping it going. Um. Don't go away, just don't go away. Uh, just one other thing, uh, we have a Dakota there in our museum. Uh, it is now 66 years old, and uh, now this is the God's honest truth. This aircraft has flown just almost 13 million miles, and we still fly it. And same with this one here, it's 61 years old, and we still fly it as well. <laughs> Tomorrow at 10 o'clock, we'll be uh, honoring the B-24 crews. And at 1 o'clock tomorrow, we'll be honoring the B-17 crews down in the Warbirds area for Warbirds in Review. I want to thank our friends from up north for coming today. Wonderful presentation, great stories, a lot of fun. Thank you, gentlemen.